Good evening. I'm Duncan McRae. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Ancient Greek and Roman Studies. Um, I'm also a faculty affiliate of the Center for Jewish Studies and uh, uh, in the graduate group uh, by Ancient History and the Mediterranean Archaeology. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to introduce this evening's lecture by Professor Andrew Berlin, which is presented by the Center for Jewish Studies with co-sponsorship by Ancient History and Mediterranean Archaeology. Professor Berlin holds the James R. Wiseman Chair in Classical Archaeology in the Department of Archaeology and Religion at Boston University, where she is also an affiliate of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies. She previously taught at the University of Minnesota and was the Leon Levy Foundation Professor of Jewish Material Culture at Bard Graduate Center in 2017. From Monday, uh, she will be uh, a Fulbright Senior Scholar to Israel uh, in residence at the University of Tel Aviv uh, for the next six months. Andrea is a leading figure in the archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, from the time of Alexander the Great uh, uh, through to the uh, early centuries of our era. A specialist in the study of ceramics, she has worked at many sites in a great arc from Troy on the coast of modern Turkey near the Dardanelles to Koptos on the Nile River in Upper Egypt. But the focus of her work has been the southern Levant at sites within the borders of modern Israel. These are too many to list, but most prominently she has worked at Talanatha and Banyas in northern Israel. She published the pottery from the Second Temple period uh, from Gamla on the Golden Heights and is currently the director of the archaeological project at Tel Kadesh, also in northern Israel. Andrea is a master at making pottery talk, unassuming sherds of pottery, even of the most humble functional kinds, reveal in her hands, at her pen, remarkable stories of trade and production, of cooking, of identity, of community, and sometimes of violence. Most recently, through her work at Tal Kadesh and with collaborators, she has been responsible for a revised history of the Southern Levant in the second century BCE. That was the period when the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, successfully shook off Macedonian Greek control and established a state in Judea. In other words, the historical events behind the more familiar Hanukkah story. By centering the archaeological record and critically using written evidence, Andrea has led the, to the, she's led, she's masterminded, she's coordinated the production of a new, much more complex history of the slow assertion of Jewish autonomy in a period of intense in, uh, imperial warfare. She is currently at work on a book titled Beyond the Temple, Jewish Households from the Maccabees to the Great Revolt Against Rome. And I think we might hear something of this tonight in her lecture, Beyond the Temple, Jewish Material Identity from the Hasmoneans to Herod. Please welcome Professor Bella. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Oh, wait, am I on? Mone, am I on? Yes, good. Thank you very, very much, Duncan. Thank you very much to all of you for, for being here. You are, you may not realize, guinea pigs, all of you. As Duncan said, I am leaving on Monday for six months in Israel to uh, push forward work on this book project uh, that this is a piece of, Beyond the Temple Jewish Material Identity. This is a project that is not about Judaism, not about belief, and not even really about practice. It is instead about something in addition to that, something that these are underpinnings for, and that is signaling who you are, signaling what you stand for. And for signaling, you know, this requires two, at least, specific components. One is that you have to have something to signal. You have to have something that you believe in. 
It's not necessarily a creed. It could be a group identity. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you might want to signal your affiliation with a university or the, who knows what. But the other thing besides what you have to signal that is required is an audience. You have to want to tell somebody, show somebody. Sometimes that somebody are more of your own. You want to show that you're a part of a group. And sometimes those somebodies are exactly not your own. And the thing about signaling is it's very context dependent. It depends on the moment and the place and those others that you're signaling to. Here's a really good example that I think most everybody in this room will recognize of a kind of signaling. And the thing that's so interesting about this signal, which we can pretty much recognize is it doesn't really tell you that much about belief and it doesn't really tell you that much about practice. Lots of people can use this same signal and fall on a long gamut of beliefs and a whole array of practices. So these three components what you believe, what you do, and what you display are good to keep in mind when we're thinking about material stuff. It's very, very common with material stuff to think that it's just a kind of illustration of what you suppose somebody is doing, that there's some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between what you show and what you practice or what you show and what you believe. And what I hope we'll look at today is how that is not the case. Now, you know, I said I'm working on a book. You may think, gosh, another book? <laughs> Don't we have a lot of books about this? And we do. We do. We have a lot of books about this. We have a lot of books about this. Uh, these are just three. I could have filled the screen, but that would have been very boring. And I think that you get the point. Um, the latest one is, is Jonathan Adler's great book. I encourage everybody to get it and read it. Terrific. Just came out. Princeton University Press 2022. Um, the thing about these and many, many other books like them is that they're about these two aspects of early Judaism. And what I hope to do is add this other component. Now, last thing I'll say in introductory prep to this presentation is um, sometimes with archaeological material, material remains, you can feel like they are just illustrations of what you already know. And what I hope also to show you today is that it's more complicated than that, that in fact, once we add the material remains and we put them in their place, we see that you might be able to adduce various things about belief and various things about practice, but display lends a whole nother aura to the picture. So what is the moment? We're going to look pretty much at two moments, neatly separated by 100 years, nice round number. We're going to look at around 100 BCE, and then we're going to lurch ahead, <laughs> skipping a bunch of stuff in the middle. We could talk about it in questions if you feel like it, um, to the time of Herod. We're going to start with this moment um, because it is very arguably the, those three books that I just showed you the covers of, and many, many others in addition, um, have done a very fine job of demonstrating that it is quite around this moment that a, a group of Jews, Eudaioi, Judeans, whatever you would like to call them, in the southernmost Levant started to pay close attention to Torah observance. They started to not only think like Eudaioi, like Judeans, like Jews, they started to behave like Jews. 
this is the moment that Duncan was referring to of the, of the fluorescence of the Hasmonean state, the state that was um, inaugurated uh, after the rebellion and the eventually the longer and more drawn out conquest of the Maccabees than sometimes people think that they were, but we are not going to have that conversation right now. It's a moment that is most beautifully captured in um, my favorite quote about this exact time by the Roman historian Tacitus. He wrote, the Macedonian power was now weak while the Parthian had not yet reached its full strength. These are the regions that we are talking about. And as the Romans were still far off, the Jews chose kings for themselves. That's a moment, kind of special, specific moment, sort of kickoff to this conversation. It's the moment, you should be moving now, there you go. When the in, most of the middle of the southernmost Levant was controlled by an independent Jewish state, the Hasmonean Kingdom. Um, this is a moment when arguably Torah observance can be documented, but it is not yet a moment of signaling. Now in order to appreciate the point of the signaling, we need to look at and see what things were like on the ground. How were people not necessarily behaving, but displaying their bona fides, who they were. And actually, in order to do that, we need to take a step back. Because remember what I said about context. You need context in order to appreciate a choice. Choices aren't made in a vacuum. Choices are made in a context. And they're made in reaction to a situation. So what's the situation? We need to step one and a half generations back to the immediately pre-Hasmonean kingdom moment. This is only 50 years earlier. And 50 years earlier, when there was no Hasmonean kingdom, there were Eudaioi, there were Judeans, and a whole lot of other people besides, a whole lot of other people living in this area. It was kind of crowded. <laughs> it was kind of crowded. And there wasn't really exactly enough room for everybody. Some things really don't change all that much in this part of the world. And that's the way it was then, too. So you see all of these various colors. We're going to take a look at the cultural milieu through this one site. Uh, the site of Mare Shah in Idumea. This is the backdrop. This is the baseline. Um, we're going to look at Mare Shah for a very, very good reason. Uh, there's a whole lot of archaeology there. There's a whole lot of stuff. It, it was a big site. It's been being excavated for, for many, many, many years, and there's amazing preservation there. So there's a lot to show for it. You just have to take my word for it that at many of the other sites all around here, there are all of these beautiful things that you're about to see from Mare Shah, but um, just in dribs and drabs and smaller amounts and just this because that's all that we found. So I'm using Mare Shah as a kind of type illustration, but what we know from the archaeology of this region is that Mare Shah is not odd, it's typical. All right, let's go. Beautiful part of the country, the, the so-called Shvela, it's kind of rolling hills, very well irrigated, lots of olive trees growing here. This is the, the landscape, and what you have to imagine in your mind's eye is a great big city, houses covering the hillside, houses up on the Acropolis, a double set of walls, one protecting the, the uppermost area, one uh, around the lower city, and chock-a-block full of houses, sort of like a brownstone effect. Houses one right next to the other. Houses that were built out of the, the native chalk of the land. What was in the houses? Beautiful, beautiful wall paintings. Most of the walls had colorful, 
multi different colored painted stucco designs. Designs that were made to look like marble veneer, sort of faux stone. And um, you see fragments of them here. There was probably a dining room in the upper floor. We've got the stairs of the house actually preserved. And um, so it, it often in these houses, the entertainment rooms were up top, the dining rooms were up top. In the foyer of the house was a stone table whose leg was in the form of an ionic column, a kind of wink to the wider culture of the Mediterranean world. Well, if you were so lucky to get invited for dinner at a house in Marisha, you would have seen a beautifully set table, big plates. Everybody would have had their own individual dinner plate, bright red, shiny slip, big mixing bowls for mixing the wine and the water together, um, fancy cups for drinking that wine, everything very glittery, very shiny, very showy, very kind of display oriented. And not from around here. The clay of this particular area cannot sustain glaze like this. So these are all imports, and you would have known it. You would have known it, just as if you would go to somebody's house for a fancy dinner, and the finest bone china would be put in front of you. You would know, you wouldn't have to pick up the bottom and look at the underside to see. You would be able to tell from the translucence and the, and the color and the gilding on the edges. And you'd be impressed. Uh, lots of good vintages to fill those cups. Imported wine amphoras from around the Aegean, around this, the southern and the northern Aegean roads and coasts, uh, the northern Aegean, Chios and Thassos, even the Adriatic. These are just some of the many, many, many. So you would have had lots of choice uh, if, uh, for, for your drink. Inside the houses, uh, for reasons that probably run the gamut from toys to decor items to items of some kind of respect and possibly some kind of cult or, or holding some sort of sacred space in the house were lots and lots of figurines, hundreds of figurines, clay figurines, many of these are made in the local clay of the area. So these are not things that are brought in. These were part of the demand by locals that was filled by people who worked in this area. And you see many of them um, identified here, Isis and Eros and Tiki and Silenus and Athena. You see a wide world. It's all good. This is not zero sum. This is just win-win. More is better. Diversity is fine. Who are these people? You know, you can't tell from these cultural knickknacks. You can't tell from the way they set their table. You can tell who they want to be. You can tell the sort of culture that they adopt. You cannot tell from this who they are. But we have, from Maresha, one particular uh, representation self-representation of somebody from a tomb, the whole, the whole landscape of, of the city is surrounded by, by rock cut tombs. There's all of these big rock cut tombs and they are family tombs. Many, many of them are family tombs. They have lots of space for multiple burials inside. And this is one such of those tombs. And you see there's paintings all along the um, uh, above the, the loculi, above the, uh, the slots where the bodies would have been buried. Um, and then here on the back wall, you see a very special painting adorning the back wall with two really peculiar looking jars. These jars, we know what they are. We know what these jars are. And somebody who would have gone into this tomb also likely would have been able to recognize it because they're very specific. They have um, a very high foot, and they've got a kind of band of decoration across them. These tall handles, these really weird little like dunce cap lids. 
These are a special kind of amphora that was well known in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was the prize amphora for the Panathenaic Games in Athens. Now, I have to say, if you, go, if you would have um, competed in the Panathenaic Games, you would have won one of these jars. They would have been filled with olive oil. On one side is, uh, is Athena. On the other side is the, it would have been a picture of the event that you won your, your competition in. Uh, so these were, these were very, very famous icons of both not only the particular competition, but knowledge of Athens itself. Athens and Athena, especially Athena, she was a kind of s cultural superstar in the Eastern Mediterranean at this time. One of the things that's really, really interesting about these Panathenaic amphoras on the walls of the tomb at Maresha is there are no Panathenaic amphoras for real found at Maresha. There are no Panathenaic amphoras for real found in Israel. Not even one. This is a nod. It's a quote. It's a wink. It's like a secret handshake. <laughs> it's, a, it's a way to say, I know what's what. It's a way to say, I got some cultural capital, and I'm going to show it. Who is the person um, responsible for this? Oh, wait, I think I forgot that I was going to also remind you of Athena in her superstar guy. She's just this popular lady uh, in, in this world at this time, undoubtedly because she really stood for Athens, which was this, this icon of cultural, of the, a, a kind of cultural aspiration. Um, okay, who's, who's buried here? We have an inscription. At the back end, above one of the doors, in Greek, and this is what it says. Apollophanes, nice Greek name, son of Sesmios, nice Semitic name, for 33 years, the leader of the Sidonians, they are people from the Phoenician city of Sidon, which is a different city than Maresha. It's way up on the Lebanese uh, modern coast, coast of modern day Lebanon. Um, so there was a colony of Phoenicians, Sidonians, in Maresha. Um, and this Apollophanes was the best and most kin loving of men, and he lived 74 years and then, and then he died. So, uh, a, a father with a Semitic name from the Phoenician city of Sidon gave his son a Greek name, um, and that son moved to Idumea, which is another cultural milieu with its own language and, and alphabet and, and so on and so forth. What is this baseline world? What is this baseline culture? And uh, just to remind, it's not just Marisha. It's not just, just Marissa. It's all of these cities around here. It's a culture of color, of brightness. It's a culture of display. It's a culture of comfort, kind of personal, material indulgence. It's a culture of worldliness, a culture of knowingness. You know what it sounds like? It sounds modern. It's a culture of the moment. It's a culture of the now, the here and now, this present moment. And you know what? That was the culture in Jerusalem at this moment. Now, I said to you, I'm going to show you Marisha, because not only is it so fabulous, but it's the best place to see it all, all at once. And Jerusalem is the worst place to see it. You can hardly see a thing. Very crowded city. Perhaps you've heard. Um, uh, we have from the second century BCE, occupation only from this part of the city. This is the so-called city of David. It's the big spur that runs south of the Temple Mount. 
But from the middle of the second century BC, or actually almost any part of the second century BC, we actually have remains from only one little area in the city of David. This is the area that um, today is sometimes in the news. It's called the Givati parking lot excavation site. And it looked like a little box on the, on the map, but it's actually a kind of large expanse um, in the city. And in the area of Givati, remains from the third and the first half of the second century BC have been found. But, but not, not many, because you, there's a lot of other stuff there, and there's been a multitude of destructions, and things are sort of compacted, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but in this one, from this one building, um, and then from fills in the area around, we have these kind of remains from Jerusalem from the middle of the second century BC. So you may recognize this. It's one of these imported amphoras. This is one from Rhodes, from the island of Rhodes. What are all of these things? These are the handles of the amphora. The tops of the handles of Rhodian amphoras were stamped. They were stamped with the name of the fabricant, that is the, the person whose factory it was in which it was made. And what, that was one handle. And the other handle was the name of the priest of Apollo of that year. The priest of Apollo changed every year, which is super handy, because the people who study stamped amphora handles, not me, <laughs> people very with a great eye for detail, um, have put them all in order, and they can date them. So the stamped handles are super exciting to uh, many archaeologists because they have writing on them, and they can be dated. And so they're assiduously collected. But one of the things that's lucky for us is that we know that there are hundreds of these from Jerusalem in the first half of the second century. So we know that whoever is living here, they're getting a lot of wine imported from the Aegean. What are these little weird nuggets? These are a thing called bullae, or ceilings. Um, they are blown up here like 50 times. They're about this big. And they're a little piece of clay. Here's the deal. You write a letter. You make a contract with somebody. You lease part of your courtyard so that somebody can put their animals in it, whatever. You make some official document or document that you want to keep, a rec have a record of something. You write it on papyrus, you roll it up, you tie it with a little piece of string. Then you take a piece of clay, you smush it around the string, you take your signet ring, and you impress the clay. And often, in fact, almost always, we do not have the document, and we do not find the rings, but we do find that little piece of impressed clay. And that's a record of somebody's personal signet. So here are two of those. Well, this is the back of this one. And what you can see on the back are the, are the, um, the papyrus, the residue of the, of the papyrus. So I always think that's very cool. So I like to show it. All right. So, so somebody had a ring of this. Somebody had a ring here. It's, I don't know. There, there are some kind of light. This is better if you're like in a black box and you're really looking close. So I don't know if you can make it out. But this is a draped lady. This is a lady. Here's her arm, here's another arm, and here's her long dress. And as for her, can you recognize? Can you tell? It is. It's our superstar, Athena. <laughs> she is with her shield and her spear and her, her helmet even, because nobody has a head like that, so that has to be a helmet. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so uh, recent petrological analysis of the clay of these bull, I showed that this is made from uh, clay in Jerusalem, and, and this one is coming from uh, a, a site outside of Jerusalem. So these are two people with the same kind of cultural outlook um, in living and uh, working and inhabiting the same kind of space at this moment. This is the moment, incidentally, about which the author of First Maccabees, writing about 30, 40 years later, said, 
with not admiration. In those days, some of the people joined themselves to the nations. And this is what he means. Now you can recall that milieu of Maréchal. And this is what he means. Now, he was just talking about this period. He didn't really know what was happening 50 years earlier, 100 years earlier. But we have odds and ends from Jerusalem from that time. And one of the things we know is that this is not new. This is a continuation of that world, a world of color and comfort and contact and connection and worldliness and display a world in Jerusalem that was of a piece with this wider world around it. All righty. So that's the context in which the Hasmonean state rises and forms and consolidates itself. And it is under those Hasmoneans that, to borrow Jonathan Adler's formulation in his new book, with which I agree, the Torah was promoted as a kind of national charter. This speaks to belief. And to some extent, this speaks to practice but it doesn't speak to signaling. In the formulation that I just expressed, you might think what's done is done. One and done. Now we've got it. Everybody, you know, if, if you could have put a mezuzah on your doorpost, you would have started doing it. As if everything happens in a kind of lockstep, it never happens in a kind of lockstep. We know that. We know everything is more complicated than that. The archaeology helps us see how. So now we're going to look first at what this moment looks like, this 100 BCE moment, at two sites up at the northern edge of the kingdom. One is a site that is just outside the kingdom, Tel Anafa. It's part of the sort of hinterland of the Phoenician city of Tyre. Tyre is the neighbor down from Sidon up there. And the other is Gamla. Gamla is a Jewish site. It's a Judean. It's a site that Judeans move to. And it is within the kingdom of the Hasmoneans. And these two sites are very, very close to each other. If anybody is signaling at one of these sites, they might be signaling to one another. So first, we go to Tel Anafah. We won't spend a lot of time here, because we've already actually seen most of this story. Uh, Tel Anafah is a rural site. Uh, it's, it's this kind of pathetic little hillock in the middle of a swampy area right now in the Hula Valley. Um, but it was a very, very nice place in around 100 BCE, because it was a beautiful courtyard villa. It had a big, open courtyard with columns all around. Now, it wasn't just like a pleasure spot. People actually worked here. A lot of archaeology, uh, archaeological remains from the site show us. We find grinding stones. We find weaving tools, lots and lots and lots of weaving tools. You have to imagine people working here. Not only there must have been servants, but there will also have been people, the people of the, of the house working here. But in addition to the things that they would have used for their day to day, we find fabulous stuff, fabulous stuff from this one little site. Shiny red slip dishes, fancy decorated lamps. What are the lamps for when you make a dinner party? Don't you like candles? Sometimes you like candles, right? That's what the lamps are. The lamps are part of the banquet service for, for those dinners. Um, there's uh, furniture. This, this is the Greek god Pan, but he's in his guise as um, decorating a piece of furniture. He would have been like the edge of a, a bedpost or, or a fancy table. Metal jugs, glass drinking vessels. I just have to point this out because this is the single most hilarious thing ever. Do, do you, what is it? It is a nose. How many statues have you seen without a nose? <laughs> we are the, this is the only site I know where we just have the nose. <laughs> just the nose. So you have to imagine the whole, I mean, you don't get a nose without a person. So you have to imagine the whole person. 
<laughs> oh, um, way to represent. Also, beautiful wall, not only fancy, colorful wall decoration, I will say a little over the top wall decoration, <laughs> like, whoa, really? All of this on one wall? And the, the person who studied the, the, paint, the painted stucco at Tel Anafa actually reconstructs three walls like this. That's how much stucco there is. And you really, that would have been a little much, I think. But um, anyway, very, very colorful and colorful mosaic floors. There's just one small piece left that you, that you see here. Um, even very fancy private bath facility, a private bath facility with a kind of hot tub. This is the bottom of the tub. Here's a reconstruction of it. And here you see the mosaic floor of this room. You know, you get out of the tub, you don't want to stand in dirt, just make your feet dirty. You just got, you just got all clean. So, so this very elaborate bath complex. This sort of bath complex is not uncommon in sites around here um, in this Time here, for example, is another one from the southern coastal site of Ashkelon, a tub almost identical to the one at Tel Anafa, painted stucco decoration from the same room that must have been adorning the walls. Same room. 50 years later, the Hasmoneans are here, right down the road. But this world is that world of beauty and abundance and connectivity and display and color and comfort. Gamla, not too far away from Tel Anafa, Jewish site, is a, is a town, not a rural villa. It's a town, houses all next door to each other. In this town, in house after house after house, excavators recovered the pottery that people had their daily stuff, all of the goods that they had in their houses. This array, these jars and cooking pots and everything, come from one room of one house. And you may see here something that you now recognize, these, more of these shiny red slip dishes, just like these are the ones from Marisha, but these would, are just like the ones from, from Tel Anafa. Um, also here at Gamla, lamps, which are the, these, these are, well, this one is pretty similar to this type, but these are just an abundance of imported decorated lamps. I said that at Tel Anafar, at Marisha, the lamps would have been part of a banquet service. And they may well have been used it that way here at Gamla as well. Now, they could also have been used in the home, in the practice of lighting candles, lighting lights, lighting lamps for Shabbat, for Shabbos, for the Sabbath. They could have. We know that by this time, this is a practice that's attested by other writers writing about Udayoi, writing about Judeans. But what we can't see from the remains is any practical reflection of that. There's no display of that. If people were using these lamps for that, they were using them in, in an unmarked way not a way of signaling. There may be practice here, but there is no display of the practice. Something else at Gamla, one last thing. Um, you can recognize what this is. This is the bathtub. <laughs> Sometimes it's not really that hard to be an archaeologist. Sometimes you find something, and it's like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> I get what that is. And it might remind you of the private bathing facilities that are not so uncommon around here. And it's not so surprising to find that, really. We find the decorated lamps. We find the fancy red slip pots. In other words, we find, although not as, not as much or as wealthy an array of things as we found at Tel Anafa, we find that the people who are living at Gamla are living in a similar sort of attitude toward the outside world. 
But in addition to this, in fact, right here at, on the edge of the, inside the same room at Gamla, is a brand new item on the block. And uh, you might immediately recognize this if you are aware of some of the, there's lots of conversation about these things in the, in the literature these days, so you might think that to call it a mikvah, you can. Um, sometimes people just call them <laughs> stepped plastered pools, and sometimes they abbreviate that as, what would that be, step SPP, right? SPP, step plastered pool. <laughs> um, uh, these, this, this thing, um, which seem, is a kind of immersion bath, so it's not a bath for cleansing, we've got those, um, it's, it's a bath for something else, is an invention of the Hasmoneans. The Hasmoneans invent these things. They, make, they kind of make them up out of whole cloth. There are no mikvah oat before around 100 BCE. And when they show up, they show up in only a few places. And they are places that are, or demonstrably have, close affiliation with the Hasmoneans. They are uncommon. And in many places, for example at Gamla, they go out of use. This one at Gamla goes out of use at some point in the later part of the first century BC, and it is not rebuilt. So this is, this is, I really, I'm not going to um, hang out on this conversation too much. I'm putting it in here because I understood that if I didn't bring this up, somebody in this room would raise their hand and do a whole Jacques moment at me. <laughs> I, did, I just wanted to say, you can ask, we can talk about this later. <laughs> We're going to move on now. Um, but these things pop up, but they're, but they're uncommon. And uh, now we're moving on to the next big moment, which is the time of Herod. How are we going to get to the time of Herod? We had a Hasmonean kingdom here, but the Hasmonean kings started to argue with themselves. And the people who were the kind of policemen of the Mediterranean, that's the Romans, did not appreciate that. They were fine with the Hasmonean kingdom as long as everybody kept quiet and did not bother anybody else. But as soon as they did not keep themselves in line, well, the Romans sent this extremely genial looking dude whose name is Pompey, who cleared everything up. <laughs> he took away the cities of Colesteria, which the inhabitants of Judea had subdued, put them under the government of the Roman president, confined the whole nation, uh, which had elevated itself so high before, within its bounds. So, <laughs> 63 BCE, end of the Hasmonean. Kingdom. I bring it up, why? Because there is no one-for-one -one correspondence between politics and personal choice and culture. They are, don't operate in lockstep, and sometimes things happen sort of off schedule, and then you have to come up with a different kind of explanation. After Pompey, there's a uh, several decades of political back and forthing and up and downing and around the blocking and we're not talking about any of that. We're just going to move along to the settlement which is under Herod. Herod uh, becomes king with uh, some help from his friends, the Romans. He has this, uh, this big territory and he is the um, the person who is the, is the political head of this entire region, and he turns out to also be the person who kind of sets the tone for the culture of this entire region. I have these circles, again, around all of our cosmopolitan culture cities. Inside Herod's kingdom, um, he built a really extraordinary number of palaces. It's a, kind of amazing how many palaces he built. I don't know, 9, 10, 11, something like that. All of these little yellow stars are palaces he built. Great that he built the palaces. Why? Because archaeologists love to excavate stuff like that. They love to excavate it because we find fabulous things in palaces, and we find especially fabulous things in Herod's palaces, because he knew how to live. So what do we see in the palaces of Herod? Well everybody. We're going to recognize all this stuff. We've been seeing it now for 150 years. We find beautiful 
wall paintings covering the walls and classical architecture um, used as kind of wall decor, um, uh, uh, decorating the, the reception rooms and the dining rooms of his places. We find elaborate mosaic floors, multicolored um, stones used to make fantastic designs. We find fancy red slip tableware. Again, we find lots and lots of imported amphoras again. In other words, we find this same world. This world doesn't go away. The Hasmoneans do not even make much of a dent in it. In order to see the signaling reaction, we really are not so interested in Herod. It's always fun to hang out with Herod a little because such a flamboyant dude. But what we really want to see is how is is regular folks, regular folks. And um, the place that we want to do that is Jerusalem. And to do that, we need to just advance 20 years after Herod to the time when um, after he died and the region was put under the rule of his three sons. Um, and we will first go to Jerusalem and then go back north. So a Jerusalem in the time of Herod, of course, temple, very fabulous. But across from the temple and the upper city, excavations have shown um, how the people who lived in this part of Jerusalem lived. And they lived like Herod. So these are elite Jews in Jerusalem. This is um, uh, the columns of a courtyard, um, Ionic columns probably, even though the reconstruction here shows them as Corinthian, but I think that that's probably not true. Anyway, this, is, this looks very elaborate. It looks almost palatial, but actually this was a private house. It was a private house um, with, with this big colonnaded court. Inside the houses in the upper city, wall paintings, mosaic floors. I only show you more pieces of the wall paintings because they're so beautiful. So I just had to show you some more. I mean, look at all these colors you can imagine. OK, imported amphorans, red slip tableware, same story over and over again. Fancy, OK, these are not the fanciest lamps that you've ever laid eyes on, but they are the exact same kind as what we have been seeing now. Um, these are lamps that certainly would have been used as part of a banquet service. Right around this time, um, 10 BCE, 10 CE, right around then, lamp styles changed. Uh, they just, people got tired of these and, they, and, and a new style comes up. And this new style of lamp, as you see, they have pictures on them. They're very cute. Um, lamps like this. Uh, are not made in Jerusalem, but people in Jerusalem had them. They acquired them, and they would have certainly been used as part of a banquet setting. But another kind of lamp also appears in Jerusalem at this time. You can see when you look at these lamps that they're kind of similar to the, the, the other kind that's current at this time. They have the, pretty much the same shape. Um, uh, where the wick comes out, um, they're more or less the same size. What they do not have very aggressively is a flat area in the middle for a picture. These two really, really different styles of lamp co-occur in Jerusalem. And I think, I'm not the only person who thinks this, but I think that these are lamps that were made quite specifically to use for lighting Sabbath lights. They were used not to perform a practice. That practice has probably already been being enacted regularly for over 100 years by now. They were used to signal that you performed this practice. We know in Jerusalem by the first century CE that the Sabbath was announced weekly by a person who 
stood on one corner of the newly fashioned Temple Mount and blew a trumpet. This stone, which is at the place of the trumpeting, was found immediately below this part of the Temple Mount on the, on the pavement down, down here. And you see here a reconstruction of it. So this is a moment of practice and signaling um, fused together. Another aspect of practice and signaling that's fused together at this moment are these things, which are vessels that are made out of, they're made out of chalk. Um, there's vessels in all sorts of shapes that are made out of chalk, great big jars, big basins, small plates, cups, dishes, and mugs of this sort, which are probably for hand washing, probably for hand washing. Here's the thing about these chalk vessels. One of the things that I've been talking to you about is clay. Oh, the clay is local, it's not local, you can tell, the slip is shiny, so on and so forth. The thing about these chalk vessels is they come from this actual place. The chalk itself is the land. It's the ground. It's not stuff on top of the ground or around it. It's the ground itself. And the workshop sites of these chalk vessels, um, this, is a, this is the cave of Chizma, which is just outside Jerusalem, and this is Chirbet Reina, which is up in the Galilee. The caves are, are hollowed out by people quarrying them and then um, turning the stone itself into these vessels. In Jerusalem, in a house, a wealthy house in Jerusalem, you would see all these things, items that show color and comfort and worldliness and items that signal practice. But outside of Jerusalem, outside of the wealthy houses of the city, all those other things go away. At this time, in the early part of the first century CE, well, they can't just have lamps and mugs. What do they eat off of? They eat off of plain, small, dishes made out of the local clay. No color, no slip. They're not even very big. People don't have individual dinner plates anymore. Cooking pots of one sort, jars for water, and probably wine and oil. And that's it. No banquets, no plates, and dishes for them, no fancy lamps to light the table. This is not the culture that we have been seeing. This is very, very specifically a culture of plainness. It's a culture of restraint. It's a culture just of what you need and no more. It is a culture quite deliberately evoking this place, not the outside world, this place. And it is a culture, some pieces of which anchor you in time, the cycle of the week, the calendar that undergirds and surrounds and frames your life. When I started, I said that one of the things about display is that you need an audience. Who is the audience? For all these Jews who are now quite deliberately choosing this other culture, I think part of the audience are these Jews.
this is a moment where signaling tells us something much more and something much different than just an understanding of what people may have believed and what people may have done. Because it tells us that there is a rift. It tells us that there are two different views of the world and how to be in it. We started with a moment. This is another. At this moment, we know from Josephus, a certain Judas, a Gamlanite from a city named Gamla, threw himself into the cause of rebellion and appealed to the nation to make a bid for independence. You grow up in a culture that's so different, so observably different, feels so different from those around you. And it teaches you something about who you are. Well, this is a moment, but it wasn't quite yet the moment, 10 CE. I just want to end by saying that culture, it matters. You absorb it, and sometimes as you grow up in it, you can choose to act on it. It's something different than belief, and it's something different than practice. It's something that helps you decide and stand to the way you are in the world. And it's this culture, this one, that inspired Judas and led to a moment that you might almost feel was preordained once that culture arrived. And that's the moment where the culture that we have just identified was snuffed out. Thank you.